Hello everybody, Terence Lehu here with another episode of The Intellectual Agrarian, where we talk philosophy from the farm. Both philosopher and farmer, our guest today is Scott Hebert from Flavorful Farms in British Columbia and host of the Stoic Metal podcast. Together, we discuss how Scott started farming, define what Stoicism actually is, talk about how he's actually applied this philosophy to his farm, and so much more. So get ready for this episode with Scott Hebert. Scott, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Terrence. So let's get started by telling us a little bit about your farm. So I'm growing vegetables in Chilliwack, BC. Chilliwack is about an hour outside of Vancouver, and Right now, I'm farming on a very small piece of land, or yeah, it's about an eighth of an acre, and I'm selling uh, bagged greens to grocery stores. So I'm doing five ounce bags of spring mix, spinach, arugula, and then I have, uh, I call it a smoothie blend, but it's just uh, red Russian kale and spinach. Well, first of all, congratulations. You're our first Canadian guest. Thank you for being (laughs) on the show. Uh, And then secondly, I think that's a great idea, having that mix Yes, because yeah. especially at farmers markets, because that's kind of what I did before this. Sometimes the people walking through are just kind of like, so what can I use this for and that for? It's just easier when you take away the confusion. Totally. And anything that sells anything that you can um, sell raw or sorry, eat raw sells better. So carrots will sell better than beets because you have to cook beets most of the time unless you're going to juice them or something. Right. But carrots, you can just go get a snack. So I like it's kind of funny because people that are into eating fresh and organic, they're like, oh, yeah, we don't mind cooking and all this stuff, but they do mind cooking. At the end of the day, a lot of food is about convenience, right? That's why you go to a restaurant. It's convenient. You don't have to cook for yourself, right? You can just sit there with your friend and enjoy the meal. But even for the organic vegetables, um, that's still like convenience is still a really big factor. So all of my products, you can eat raw or you can cook them. Mm-hmm. So there's just a lot of... Uh, variety or variability i guess in it and that's a that's an excellent point because again it's an extra step i even in my life as much as i'm more of a red meat eater and yep. i've transitioned more into eating more vegetables as i've gotten older mm-hmm. but that's probably the number one thing i do enjoy about a good salad is i don't have to spend a half an hour cooking it or getting it ready i rinse the produce set it in the bowl to dry and then i eat it yeah, yeah. My my go tos for all summer have been um, I've been doing green smoothies, mm. and uh, it's just so convenient. Like I have my huge bag of red Russian kale or whatever, like my seconds, right? I sell all my good stuff and I eat all my seconds, uh-huh. like all my all my bad stuff. So, um, so I have a huge bag in my fridge, blend it up, and it's so convenient for me to make a huge thing of juice, and I can I either have it like one in the morning and then half of it later on, or I can save it for the next day and it's still good. Um, it's just like, it's just convenient for me to be able to do that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is slightly almost going on a tangent, but I am curious about this because as I said, I'm getting more into it. What do you use for making a good green smoothie? Okay. I've got my green smoothie dialed in now. So (laughs) the first thing that you want to do is you want to take your greens and you want to blend them up with your liquid first. Okay. Most of the time, like when you're like putting so much stuff in there, it won't blend up because like the greens are the last thing to blend. So that's the very first, that's like the key to making a really good um, green smoothie. And of course, this is all being said that you should have a good blender. Like if you have a Mm -hmm. crappy blender, um, you're probably not going to make that good of a smoothie no matter what, just (laughs) because it's going to be all chunky and gross. Uh But you want to blend up the greens first. So I take my greens, usually it'll be red Russian kale and spinach. Um, throw it in there and I make, I make a huge jug of green tea that I keep in my fridge. Mm -hmm. So I'll make like a picture of that. So, so first thing goes in there is the greens and the green tea, right? That's my liquid. So I blend that up until it's like pretty good. Then I'll take a scoop of uh, Greek yogurt, a little bit of ginger. I buy like 20 lemons at a time and I, I juice them all up and I have just like fresh lemon juice in a bottle in my fridge. So I take a splash of that, put it in there. Um, I've been trying to do, I used to do a lot more berries in there because uh, BC has this beautiful temperate climate where we just have fresh berries basically all year because it's like they're so conducive to growing them here. So um, yeah, I throw berries in there quite a lot. And lately I've been throwing a scoop of like 
BCAAs, branch chain amino acid, is just like a workout thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of like got a little pineapple flavor. So that's what I've been going to lately. Maybe I'll crack an egg or two in there. It usually just depends on kind of uh, what's available and what's going on. But yeah, that's usually my go-to. And uh, that tastes pretty good, especially with the, uh, like a little, just a little bit of sugar from the berries or from the BCAAs is delicious. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to try making that myself soon. So moving along, can you give us a brief biographical sketch uh, and kind of tell us what led you to farming. Yeah, so this is kind of like a crazy, messy way of going about it. But um, I used to be really fat and I got into doing mixed martial arts. And I really liked doing that. And I uh, just found out about whole food and eating healthy. Um, I lived on a five acre piece of property with my parents. And then um, I actually bought part of that property from them. So I was living on a piece of land. I was seeing the value in whole foods and how it was affecting me. Cause I went from 220 pounds to 150 pounds. Wow. Um, Congrats. Yeah, it was, thanks. So like, I, like it had, it had like implications in my life in every single area of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like I was smarter, uh, my brain worked better. I was, uh, better with girls, like all these good things. Right. So I was seeing a lot of value with that. And then I was kind of really thinking that I was going to get into like the working out aspect of it. And then I really started to think about food. And then I realized that um, a lot of people, the big barrier to them is they don't have access to land. And I was sitting on all this land. Yeah. Um, so it just, we, we rent the, uh, one of our fields out to just a dairy farmer down the, down the road. Like he just takes it over and makes it into corn yeah. and hay. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I knew that that was a good opportunity if I could make it happen. So I was working at this uh, kitchen cabinet shop with my dad. It was his business. And I, but I knew I wanted to farm, but I didn't didn't want to be a poor farmer, right? I wanted to make money farming. <laughs> That's always so, helpful. That's always yes. helpful. Yeah, I didn't want to be poor, <laughs> so uh, um, if I could help it, right? So, um, so I tried to figure out about how I could have some sort of business on my property that made money, right? So I wanted it to be good for the environment, good for my community, and good for me. And by good for me, I mean. I wanted to make an income that I could live off of. Like I didn't want to be poor. I didn't want to experience that. Right. Mm -hmm. If I can help it. So I was trying to figure out about this way. And then I found out about this thing called spin farming, which is small plot intensive. And it was a vegetable growing uh, system that uses hand tools on a small land base. And I thought this is perfect. Um, I can start small, test the waters, see if my idea works and then expand. So I, uh, the job with my dad ended um, two years ago, and then I uh, was trying to find a, a, who was the best spin farmer in my area. And uh, there was this guy named Curtis Stone, and he was two and a half hours away from me. And he actually, this was kind of a little bit before like his content started blowing up, but now he's got like 150,000 people on his YouTube channel, and he's got online courses and all this stuff. But uh, I went up there and did a uh, consultation with him, and. Uh, he was just starting his online course. And so I signed up for that. And then, uh, yeah, I started selling. I quit my job in June or July. And by October, I had microgreen sales at restaurants. And then in December, I ran a Kickstarter and raised like $5,600 to help finance my farm. And then, um, yeah, it's just been like a whirlwind ever since then. So this is the, I just finished the end of my um, second season right now. I just took my last orders to the grocery stores uh, yesterday. So, yeah, it's been fun. That's awesome. Uh, I recently read a book called Real Artists Don't Starve. I think that there should be a version of that, that says real farmers don't starve. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's so funny. I know it's really funny. I tell people all the time, I'm like, I'm like, I'm doing this to feed myself. But I don't mean that like I'm growing the food for myself. I mean that like I want to make enough money so I can go to the grocery store <laughs> and get stuff, right? Um but yeah, that's really funny. Uh, I think that's a really big deal. Like a lot of people get into farming for all these ideologies and they're fine. That's great. Mm -hmm. I have all the ideologies too. I want to save the world. Um, I want to change my community. I want to impact people and stuff. But you have to, it has to be good for you too. Mm -hmm. Like you're not going to save anyone if you don't have your own shit together. So, mm -hmm. And I think that that's so important because it's kind of like anything that someone goes into saying it's an ideological thing. And then they play the martyr where, oh, I'm suffering for, I'm suffering oh, yeah. for the helping other people. And I'm yeah, like, you don't no. get bonus points. You don't get to pay. No one's going to pay an extra dollar on your vegetables because you're having a hard time. That's not yeah. how the market works. I mean, if you're not making money farming, it's because you're not a good farmer. 
or you're not yeah. a good businessman. It's not because yeah. you're suff- it's not because you're suffering for your art. That's Absolutely. recently become a little bit of a hobby horse with me. I know a couple of people like that. I'm like, dude, just just stop farming. Just please stop farming. Yeah. Not always know, the best I mean, thing to say as an organic inspector, but you know. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's true, right? Um, there's some people that just have the wrong mindset. I mean, like, honestly, if my farm isn't profitable, because um, like right now, sorry, right now I still have a full-time job, so I'm trying to transition to going full-time on my farm. Mm-hmm. But if if my farm is not going to be able to provide me the income that I want, I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep farming. I'm going to quit farming Mm -hmm. and I'm going to grow vegetables on my land and have it be fun and awesome. And I'm not going to try to make money off of it. And I'm going to be happy as hell doing that. Mm -hmm. But if I can make money, I would really like that. I would like to live in that world. Yeah. Let's live in the world where we can make money and do what we enjoy. I mean, isn't that the goal? Absolutely. Now I want to get into your podcast, of course, and how you've applied philosophy to your farm. But first, can we give the audience a bit of a definition for stoicism? Because I think that there could be some confusion in that. Yeah, there's a lot if of confusion. If you don't know on, what a stoic, what stoics or stoicism is. Totally. So um, I think the first thing that we have to do is uh, say the difference between a lowercase s stoic and a capitalized s stoic. So a lowercase s stoic in like common vernacular means someone who's uh, suppressing or repressing their emotions. Um, they have like a stiff upper lip trying to be unemotional. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is stoicism, an ancient Greek philosophy that started 2000 years ago. Um, there's two kind of like main points I would say to it. The first is the dichotomy of control. So, um, there's things that are inside of your control and there's things that are outside of your control. You try to focus on the things that are inside of your control and be indifferent to things outside of your control. So you don't control what happens, but you control how you respond. And the second half of it is um, the Stoics believe that virtue was the sole good. And what they meant by virtue is having excellent character. So you're trying to be the best version of yourself in every single situation. Okay. And, I heard you had explained this on your podcast once, and it makes a lot of sense to me. I have a friend, I'm sure we all have friends like this, who they are naturally stoic. Yes. They just, they don't show much emotion. They tend to be quieter, just kind of, eh, with a lot of things in life. So when I first heard the word stoic, I, of course, think of them. Yes. But then I actually started reading Marcus Aurelius mm-hmm. or Seneca, and you're like, oh, no, that that's different. That is different. Yeah, totally. Uh yeah, like when I first started to get into stoicism, I only knew about the dichotomy of control, like about being indifferent to the things that are outside of your control. And I thought that's what it was. And it wasn't really until I started going in deeper when I started my podcast that I was like, oh, there's this old, whole other half about being a good person that I didn't really know about. And it's like really neat because uh, I already I already liked the philosophy before that. But then once I started getting into it on um, just starting to see the benefits of it, I was like, wow, this is like this is pretty amazing. Are you also on the lookout for the next best book? Long ago, I made it my goal to read a minimum 12 good nonfiction books per year. And this year, I've made that list available to all of you. It contains books ranging from practical businesses like Made to Stick by the Heath Brothers and books about story like John Truby Presents The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. I like to read eclectically, and I hope you do too. You can get this list by going to intellectualagrarian.com forward slash reading. Or simply click the link in the description. Once again, that was intellectualagrarian.com forward slash reading. So what was your first introduction to stoicism? Um, Did you find a book on the shelf? What happened? No, it was messy. So I had like, so say about like 2015, this, it actually followed when I started my farm in 2015, it probably followed like a really similar timeline. Um, Mm -hmm. So I had seen like a, some blog posts on Tim Ferriss' website, um, just different things like that. You know, it was popping up every once in a while, like stoicism, stoicism. And I didn't really, like, bite on it, though. I didn't really know what it was. I kind of, like, freak looked at it. I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds good, right? Um, but I didn't really know what it was. There was, like, I thought Seneca was uh, Senna, you know, that Brazilian race car driver? <laughs> I, yes. Yeah, I, thought they were, <laughs> I was just like, why is he talking about this? So um, so I had, didn't really know anything like that. So um I didn't, I like, I never went to school or anything, uh, like, uh, university. So I never Mm -hmm. got into like reading or 
anything like that. I probably read like one book a year for, for like 10 years type of thing. And then in 2015, I really started to realize the value in reading. And so I started to read a lot more. So I was making my way through this guy's reading list. And one of the books on the list was the obstacle is the way by Ryan holiday. So what Ryan did with his book, it's not really, um, it's not really a book about stoicism, but there's this, there's this one quote where Marcus Aurelius says the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. And so it's about Ryan's book is about turning your obstacles, turning your trials into triumphs. And then he goes through and he um, talks about Stoic philosophy and then he gives like contemporary examples or people from history that have u- turned their trials into triumphs. And so after I got done with that book, I was like, wow, uh, I think that there's something a lot more to this stoicism thing than I originally thought. So I started going in deep after that. I got, I got uh, better translations of uh, Marcus Aurelius and Epictetus and Seneca, who are all the main three big players of ancient stoicism that we still have stuff from. And then, um, yeah. And then Ryan wrote another book called, uh, the daily stoic and that came out. And so I got that and I was like, damn, this is really cool. Then I started to try to look for a podcast about it. And there wasn't really anything. The, the people that had podcasts, they never really kept up with the show or didn't really do what they said they were going to do. Like some people said that they were going to do like a weekly show or bi-weekly show and like come out like every other month. Right. So I was just like, okay, I think there's a opportunity to do this. Like, do I, do I like this enough? Do I know enough about it? And like, not really know. I didn't really know that much. Didn't really know how I was going to do it. So, um, so I tried to make my show like that. I was learning alongside of everyone. So it's training as much for me as it is for my audience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You do provide these stoic trainings. Uh, you provide these exercises, quotes, usually start the show from one of these three great stoics. Yeah. And then kind of give some practical application from your own life. Mm-hmm. Would you mind sharing something along those lines, giving us an example of how that works sure. to the audience here? Yep. So um, there's one stoic exercise called uh, decatastrophication, or there's a couple different names for it, but negative visualization is one. Um, in the, the ancient stoics actually called it uh, premeditatio malorum. So that means the premeditation of evils. So what you're going to do is you're going to imagine things going the worst way that they could go. And by putting yourself through that, you're going to be prepared for if that thing actually does happen. So for an example, Mm -hmm. at the beginning of the year, um, I was going to start selling. So at the end of last season, I had a whole bunch of extra lettuce and I took it to grocery stores to see if they were interested in my product. And they all said yes. And I was like, awesome, really cool. So I was going to start selling there in the spring, right? But I didn't have contracts. I just had promises of sales. So basically, I was going all winter thinking that I was going to start selling at these stores, but I didn't know if that was actually going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, I believe it when they give me money. So Uh I was experiencing quite a lot of stress and anxiety because I was planting out lettuce and planting out spinach, and I didn't know if it was all going to work out or not. And I didn't really have any other plans because I still had a full-time job, right? So it's not like I could, it's not like I was mm-hmm. doing a farmer's market and restaurants and grocery store. Like I was just going to be doing just the grocery yeah. store. So if this blew up in my face, like what's going to happen? I'm pretty scared, right? And the other thing too is like uh, it has real world consequences uh-huh. and stuff because like um, when I get nervous and stuff, I drink. <laughs> so so it's not like like it's got like <laughs> real world implications if I crumble under that pressure. You know what I mean? So. Um, so what I had to do was I had to sit there and I ran through my mind, my most catastrophic worst case scenario. So I thought about going to the store, taking my lettuce, taking a sample, going to the store, shaking the guy's hand again, seeing him. Um, and he says, no, sorry, Scott, we're going in a different direction. Right. I walk out of the store. I'm like, damn, Uh now I've got a field full of lettuce. Like what's my next move going to be? And then, so you start thinking about it. Like how can I make this not a catastrophic situation? And I started thinking, well, you know what? I do have a full-time job. So it's not like I was relying on my farm, um, for an income, right? All my stuff on my farm Mm -hmm. is already paid off. So it's not like I have to worry about trying to keep up with debt. Um, I have a field full of Mm -hmm. lettuce, but like if I don't have to 
harvest and process orders, I have time to throw all that lettuce in the compost, right? So all of a sudden, yeah. this thing that I was experiencing a whole lot of anxiety about um, really melted away and became a lot calmer because I did this exercise. And I had to do that exercise like a lot, probably any time that like the doubts became overwhelming or I got really anxious about it. But um, it didn't take away all my nervous energy, but it, it took the nervous energy that I did have and it allowed me to do something productive instead of destructive, like drinking. <laughs> so it's kind of like almost introducing if we're going to use biological terms, almost like giving yourself a little bit absolutely. of a shot of an antibiotic to the yeah. possible disease yeah, so absolutely. that you're prepared for it. Yeah. So okay. you're just, uh, putting yourself through a little bit of, yeah, you're just thinking about what the worst thing is. Um, the decatastrophic, um, decatastrophication is actually a term from the psychological literature. So if you're going to catastrophize something that's like, when so if like I went to the store, I could have been, and the guy says we're not gonna take your products. I could have been like, oh no, this is the worst case ever. This guy screwed me over. Um, like he told me last year that I was gonna start selling there. Um, f him, do this right, and I would have gone like, I just would have went on a tangent. When you get hot like that, it's really hard to make good choices. But if I went there and I'd already mm -hmm. gone through the exercise, I shake his hand, I say thank you for your time, I walk away, I already know what my next move is. Because with stoicism, you're always supposed to default on action. It's not like, it's supposed to be a very practical philosophy, a very how to live philosophy. It's not like, let's talk about some esoteric weird stuff. This is trying to improve your life uh -huh. through action. So it's always supposed to default on action. So by going through the decatastrophication, I already had my actions planned out for what I was going to do if that happened, right? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, exactly. I think one of the things that I like about stoicism as I've learned more about it is there's, it, it really doesn't try to push anything that is woo woo. We're not trying to worship oh, some yeah. space thing that we don't know about. And it, it is practical things for daily life. It's so much, I grew up in a very uh, old fashioned Protestant family and I typically am that way myself. So a lot of these principles kind of already carry over from just what we'll call Max Weber's Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism. So it, I just like how it's very simple. It is how to live life. It is living a good yeah, life. It is. It's uh, it, yeah. I like when I first started to, when I, I was really thrown off by philosophy, like I didn't want to, I didn't want to read books about philosophy. Like, honestly, like, the only reason I read that obstacle is the way is because it was on someone's reading list. Otherwise I probably wouldn't have got to it. Like I knew it was about stoicism uh -huh. and I was like, I'm not going to waste my time. Like, why would I read that when I could, there's so like, I haven't read that many books. So there's so many other good books that I could read that are going to have very practical implications mm -hmm. on my life. Like, why would I read this weird book about something that's not going to help me? And then I read it and I was like, Oh no, this mm -hmm. is going to help me. Um, <laughs> like when I read, so when I read uh, Ryan's book, the obstacle is the way, um, I had before I had done stuff where I like turned my trials into triumphs, but I never like had done it that quickly before. Like it always took me a long time to like go through the process of finding it out. But mm -hmm. so I read Ryan's book and, um, I was going to go in the farmer's market in my first season of farming. And, uh, two weeks before, two weeks before I was supposed to go into the farmer's market, um, I had sent in my application and the guy said, oh yeah, don't worry. Like he, I talked to him the, the summer before and he said, yes, you can come in the farmer's market. I sent in my application in the spring and uh, I didn't hear anything back. And I emailed him and I called him twice. And he's like, he told me on the phone. He's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Like, I'm sure it'll be fine. And then two weeks before the season was supposed to start, I got an email and it said, uh, hey, Scott, um, based on the products you're offering, we're not going to be able to offer you a spot in the market. Sorry. And I was like, shit. Like, what am I going to do? Because I already had stuff. Yeah. Like, it was two weeks. I already had all my stuff planted. I felt screwed over. I was like, this guy told me. Like, I went and seen him at the farmer's market. He told me to my face. I talked to him on the phone. He spoke to me. He told me that I was like, that it was, I was mad, right? There was no other way to get into this. But, and I wanted to freak out really badly, but I didn't. I just stayed calm. And I thought, I thought this isn't bad because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to project, like, I wanted to, that's what I wanted to say about that event, right? I wanted to say that it was bad. But I thought to myself, this isn't bad. This is different. This is different than what I thought was going to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, right? So I sat there in front of my computer after seeing the email, and I thought, like, okay, what's my next move? Because like I said before, it's supposed to default on action. You have to make an action. So I had this idea for this buying club that I was going to do. But I didn't have enough time to do it because I was already going to be doing restaurant sales and going to the farmer's market. But now that I didn't have to go to the farmer's market, <laughs> I had time to do something else, 
right? So I started doing <laughs> buy and club thing. And uh, yeah, yeah. So that was that was like that was the first time where it was like instant. It was like I had this problem, and I was just like, no, screw this. I'm gonna I'm gonna become better from this. I'm not gonna let this thing knock me down. I'm mm-hmm. gonna be better. I'm gonna beat this thing. So that was that was kind of a cool experience. So it gives you a mental model for how to take situations Absolutely. and redirect them almost. Yeah. Because like, yeah, any challenges that you face in life are an exercise in how to live with virtue. So how to be the best, best version of yourself, right? So like when that farmer's market thing happened, I could have crumbled there. I could have attacked that guy. Like, honestly, I think I know the people that said that, that probably like, uh, I know the farmers who probably didn't let me in there. You know what I mean? Um, so uh-huh. I was like pissed. Yeah. I worked yeah, in farmers yeah. so markets. I, I know like, what the politics are. I was are. ready to bust heads, man. <laughs> like I was like, uh, you know, I was mad. Like when I get angry, I can feel like the entire temperature of my body get hotter. Like it, there's a very like physical thing. And I'm uh-huh. just like, I feel all my muscles get tighter. Like my, I can make fists. Like I'm ready to, I'm ready to mess stuff up. Right. <laughs> so like it takes for me a lot for me to snap out of that and be like, whoo, calm down. Right. But like, yeah, I go to like bad places. But uh, with this, instead of turning that into destructive energy, which is like attacking other people, I'm using this as an experience where I can um, show the best version of myself, right? And the best version of myself is not giving in to what those other people were doing, but just trying to be the best version of me and like uh, treat other people nicely, even if they're being mean to me. So when that guy sent me that email, I said, thank you for your time. That's the email I sent back. I didn't say, F you, buddy. Like, screw you. You screwed me over. Just said, thank you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. So I was going to ask how you've applied philosophy to your farm, but we're getting a lot of that already. Are there any other instances where you can think to yourself, I took this principle and um, applied it to my yeah, farm? Yeah, I mean, I don't really think about it so much like... <laughs> Like, it's not really a linear thing like that where I'm like, you know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. It's kind of more just like I'm going through my everyday yes. life. And then sometimes something will happen and um, I'll be going back into the philosophy afterwards, reading stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah, this this is this. This is what happened here. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, like there's a there's one quote from Seneca. And he says, uh, he says, if a man knows not to w- which port he sails, no wind is favorable. So what he's saying there is that you mm-hmm. have to know which opportunity, like where you want to go so you can know which opportunities are good, right? So when I was first going to start my farm, I needed $20,000, but I didn't have it. But I did have a $20,000 truck, right? So it was like my choices were, do I want to keep this truck and save face and have everybody think I'm rich and cool? Or do I want to sell that and do I want to start my farm? This probably seems like a pretty big um, like situation to someone. But for me, it was almost a non-decision because I knew where I wanted to go, right? So when I seen this quote from Seneca, mm-hmm. and then I started to think about some of the choices that I made like backwards, I was like, that was it right there. Um, there's another quote from Seneca, and he says, uh, you have to put yourself through a hard winter training and not be rushing into things for which you aren't prepared. And that's what I did with my farm, um, like when I was first going to start out doing it. I didn't just go and plant vegetables and plant seeds with no direction, right? I went and did consulting. I went and did online courses. I went and read books. I went and listened to podcasts. Like I did all these things to put myself in the best position so that when spring 2016 happened, I was ready as I could be. Um, so there's a whole bunch of things like that that happened. But um, I've definitely been thinking about like it's a lot now that I get deeper into it, I guess it's a lot more, it's a lot more kind of linear where I'm thinking about it. Um, but yeah, it's really fun. Like mm-hmm. it's got, I, I actually am very su- surprised about how many, about how applicable it is. Like I've been pleasantly surprised over and over and over th- with stoicism. What are some resources you can recommend for the listeners who want to perhaps dip their toes into um, the pond of stoicism? So, Listen to my podcast, <laughs> but um, <laughs> definitely go listen to his podcast. The yeah, link is um, in the description. The one really nice thing about the ancient Stoics is that they're extremely accessible. And by that, I mean, you don't have to have an education to, to understand what they're saying. If you get a modern translation, which is, it's really important to get like a good translation of the Stoics. 
but if you get a good translation, um, it's crazy. Like when I first started reading it, it seems like you think like this is 2000 years ago, right? This is the, like the time when Jesus was walking around. You think that um, you would think that this would be like so different. But when you read it, it's almost like it's like reading something that uh, it seems so familiar. It's got this very familiar ring to it. And it's, uh-huh. it's very strange. So um, Marcus Aurelius has a book called Meditations. And uh, that's a really good one. It's um, it's got like 10 different chapters. They're called books in the book. But so it's got like 10 different books in it. But they're just like short little paragraphs or a sentence. And um, he was writing a diary to himself at night. And he was just writing stuff down about Mm -hmm. um, how he should treat people or different ideas. And so that book is a book of quotes. And that one's uh, I really like that book. That's that's a really uh, good place to start. Um, Epictetus has the Enchiridion, which is another kind of a same thing. One of his students um, compiled a list uh, from his talks, from his lectures. And they're kind of it's kind of like the best of Epictetus, the Enchiridion. So that's really nice. too. He talks about um, like what's inside of your control, what's outside of your control and being indifferent to it and all that stuff. And then Seneca wrote. 121 letters to his friend Lucilius, and they're they're longer. Um, Seneca was uh, he was a playwright, and he was very good at writing. So um, they're really beautiful. It's really it's really lovely to read his work. Um, as far as contemporary stuff, uh, I think the Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman is an excellent book to start off. They have what they do is the book is broken up into 365 quotes, so you can have one for every day. Um, at the top, they have a quote from one of the ancient Stoics. And then below that, Ryan will write a little paragraph about what he thinks that means, right? So um, that's a really good one. I really like the Daily Stoic because uh, Stephen Hanselman, who did the translation uh, in it, did like a, a fantastic job. And they're really easy to you, really easy to read, sorry. And um, you get stuff from all of the guys in one book, right? So you get stuff from Epictetus, you get stuff from Seneca, and you get stuff from Marcus all in the same book. And it's really easy to read because, like, when you go through Marcus's book, like, these books, I leave them lying around my house, and then I go and open them up and look at, like, two or three lines and put it down. It's not really something where I'm, like, reading cover Uh to cover every day. That's not really how I use them. So the Daily Stoke's really good because it's got one for every day. So you go open it up, read one quote, read one paragraph, done. So it's the Stoic devotional, which is perfect yes, for and they're actually just coming use. out right now um with a stoic journal that works in tandem with that because journaling is actually a really good stoic practice too well scott thank you so much for being on the show uh people definitely need to go listen to your podcast it's fantastic as we wrap up where can the audience learn more about your farm your work um, and your podcast definitely check out my podcast uh, it's available should be available on every podcast player every podcast catcher and um my farm is called Flavorful Farms, and uh, I'm mainly active on that on Instagram and Facebook. Um, for my podcast, I have stuff on everything, but uh, the biggest, best thing to do is just listen to the show. Scott, thank you again so much for being on the show. This has been a fantastic conversation. <laughs> I think we could probably go on even longer. Uh, thanks again. I hope we can have you again on the show sometime. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Scott for being on the show. Go check out his podcast, Stoic Metal. Link in the description. I've been listening to it for a while now, and it has practical insights for applying stoic principles to your everyday life. Thanks, as always, for listening. Once again, if you want our 12 books of the year list, go to intellectuallibrarian.com forward slash reading. As always, I'm Terrence Leahy. This has been The Intellectual Librarian reminding you to keep farming the dream.